Good morning, church family. We'll be continuing in John chapter 12 in the Pew Bibles. That's on page 846. Sorry. We'll be starting in verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. This is God's word. Thank you, Brian. I, I hope you have had a good Thanksgiving, but eat too much. Um, any of you have family that's come in the area uh, to, to be with you? I know we did. We had three of our kids with us on Thanksgiving Day, and then our fourth child, our second oldest, Vanessa, right here in the front, came and surprised us yesterday. But uh, so uh, we are we are thankful for family. Uh, and yes, ESL um, can be dismissed. And I guess four through kindergarten, you know what to do. Almost forgot again, but I wrote it on my notes. But uh, anyway, so we know we have enjoyed our time with, uh, with family and, and enjoying Thanksgiving together in that way. Now, now, just curious, how many of you have now begun to listen to Christmas songs? It's now okay. Anybody got a playlist going? I cheated. I started a little earlier uh, this year. Yeah, I know that's the unwritten rule. I've got to wait think after Thanksgiving, but um, I started a little bit earlier. But anyway, this is a great time of year for family traditions. And I remember when I was growing up, one of the, my favorite things to do as a child was to go out on Christmas Eve and, and look at the Christmas lights. And there was always, I don't know, two or three houses that were really all, all decked out. You know, the ones with the plastic Santa Claus, with the reindeer. If they were really good, they were actually on the roof. Uh, you had your obl obligatory uh, manger scene down, you know, somewhere. With, in those days, it was kind of a little bit gaudy looking. I don't know, kind of weird. Uh, if you were lucky, you also had a cedar tree in your yard, and you had some lights going around that, and that was, that was it. I think we probably would have to change our definition of what going all out for Christmas is these days. I know there's a lot of houses that have lights going on and to music and flashing, and you turn, tune your radio in to those songs, and... And you know, these neighborhoods that were really um, designed for five cars an hour, now you've got a parking lot with just hundreds of cars out there. Anybody live next to somebody like that? I don't know. Well, you're going to have to tell me where to go to see all these nice Christmas lights because uh, we're, we're new to the area. So just make sure you tell us after. I, I do enjoy doing that. I, I enjoy going by and uh, looking at these lights. Um, but the question that I think we really need to ask ourselves as we begin to go into this Christmas season is, do we see the Christmas light? Do we see the light of the world? I mean, among all the flashing lights of the season, do we see the light? But not only that, do, do we see the multifacetedness? The different aspects of the light. Do, do we see Jesus in all of his glory and all of his splendor? Jesus is not monochrome. He shines brightly. In the, in the world that we live, with, it, live in, with all of its busyness and, and all of the individualism, uh, the, the secular outlook on life, the politically charged atmosphere that we find ourselves in, it can be difficult to see Jesus, can it? To see Jesus for who he truly is, who he has revealed himself to be. 
think we allow things to cover up all the different aspects of who He is and ultimately we are left with an insufficient and incomplete version of Jesus. We fashioned a Jesus according to our wants, according to our pleasures, our desires. It's like taking a, a strand of Christmas lights, if you will, and just saying, well, you know, I'm going to get some tape and cover up some of these lights. Just, it's just not the same. It's not as bright. You don't see all of the colors. Why would we want to do that? But what if we could see him for who he truly is? I mean, don't we want to see Jesus for who he is? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to you now and we just ask that you would open our eyes to see Jesus through your word, to have a better understanding of who he is and what that means for our lives. May you challenge us. May you encourage us. May you just remove the blinders from our eyes and allow us to see the light of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we dig in and we begin to gaze upon the brilliance of the light, let me just say a few words about the context of these verses that Brian read for us this morning. Uh, the, these verses, 48, uh, 44 through 50, come at the very end of Jesus' public ministry. I mean, this is it. His public ministry is coming to an end in chapter 12. Chapters 13 to the end just basically cover almost just one, one night or just a, just a couple of days of, of the rest of his ministry. But his public ministry has come to an end. And this is a particularly interesting teaching that, that John includes here at this point in his gospel. We, we don't know exactly when Jesus said these words. We don't know what the occasion. We really don't even know who he said them to. But they do serve to, to you know, in a way, summarize in a way of, of everything that Jesus has taught in this gospel up until this point. There, there's themes that are just repeated throughout. I mean, such as the... Um, the unity that there is between Jesus and the Father, the, the authority of the word of Jesus and the necessity to obey, the, the purpose for which Jesus came to the earth, this, this theme of light and darkness. We, we find all those themes in these passages, so they, it really does serve to help summarize Jesus' public ministry in a nice way. And all these themes and the summary statement, if you will, help to bring out the different aspects of Jesus that he invites us to see. Do we see him? Do we see the light? Now, Jesus says very clearly in verse 46, I have come into the world as light. And so what I would like to do this morning is take that phrase and use it as a springboard, if you will, to talk about four different aspects of of the light of Jesus. And that's going to be the light of His divinity, the light of His salvation, the light of His judgment, and the light of His Word. Divinity, salvation, judgment, and His Word. So let's look first at the light of His divinity. Let's look again in verse 44 and 45. It says, Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in Me believes not in Me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees the one who sent me. Now the one who sent me is, I think throughout the gospel, referred to as God the Father. Okay? And so at first glance, we might say, hey, this is just a little bit odd here. I mean, what's Jesus saying? It's almost like he's saying that there's just such a distinction between me and the Father that you know, we're, 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 we're one, but we're, we're different. Almost as if Jesus is saying that He's not God. But we got to remember, we have to interpret these words in the context of the whole entire gospel. And how does John start off his gospel, the very first verse? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was? Wait, no. The Word was? God, okay. 
the word was God. Very, very clear. I mean, John is starting off his gospel saying Jesus is divine. Now, we're not going to take the, all the time to talk about the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of God or whatever. However, announcement here, a little plug. Uh, Mike Aiken, Tony Pitts, they're, they're leading a, a study on the systematic theology using Wayne Grudem. So please come see them. It's in the bulletin, I believe, as well. An announcement about that. If you'd like to go deeper on those things, that is possible. <laughs> so I'll leave that there. But at any rate, these verses here in chapter 12... Jesus is, is remarking, is once again underlining the unity that exists between Him and the Father, and His point is clear to His listeners. To accept Jesus is to accept the Father. To reject Jesus is to reject the Father. Jesus must be accepted on His terms. It's not enough to say that Jesus was just merely a good teacher, a good man, even a perfect man, that he was a prophet. We must see him as divine. We must see him as God. Do we see the light of his divinity? Have we accepted Jesus on his terms? Or, or, or have we created a Jesus after our own choosing? Now, some perhaps would have no problem saying, no, I, I don't accept Jesus as God. I reject His divinity. And if that's you here even this morning, I, I, would, I would invite you to take another look, to consider once again. Look at the Gospels and how they present Jesus. They present us an orderly account of Jesus that can be put to the test. And you can see for yourself that Jesus is indeed truly who He says He is. But for those of us who have accepted the divinity of Christ, we must be aware that sometimes, sometimes we, we just have that knack of inadvertently rejecting His divinity. We, we begin to cover up the light of His divinity. Just like that strand of Christmas lights. We just take a little bit of tape and put it on there. See, we know that He's God. We, we profess that He's God. We say that we believe He's God. And then how do we live our lives? We live our lives in a way that says, well, I don't really know if He is God or not. Since He is God, He has all things under control. He is able to comfort our souls and to bring us the peace that we think is so impossible. He has the power to change our situations, change our circumstances. He is gracious and merciful to forgive us of our sins. He knows exactly what we're going through and can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. And yet, and yet, we find ourselves trying to control everything we find ourselves seeking comfort in everything and everyone besides jesus and by the way i'm not necessarily talking about the difficult times of life this is true also for those good times of life isn't it sometimes sometimes it's when life is going really good and we are finding success in life that we lose sight of His divinity a little bit more. We're just trying to control everything. We're, we find our comfort in, in our family that's gathered around the Thanksgiving table. We throw money around because we have it, and we're, we're just trying to make our lives better, trying to change everything. We, we effectively take Jesus and we just put Him up on the shelf. And what is using when we need him? That's no way to treat God. It's no way to treat God. Do we see the light of his divinity? Or have we just covered it up? Have we lost sight? Behold the light. He is God incarnate come to bring salvation to the world. And so this brings us to the second aspect of the light, the light of salvation. 
This is why he came. I mean, this is his purpose. This is his mission. Maybe some of you have work at a place that they have their mission statement plastered on the wall, whatever it might be. Well, here's Jesus. Look again in verse 46. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. He has come to rescue us from darkness, from the darkness of this world. And in the Gospel of John, make no doubt about it, there, darkness is sin. The sinful world that we live in, being trapped and bound by sin. And Jesus is offering a way out. And it's very clear. Whoever believes in me. The person who believes in Jesus does not remain in darkness. It is by faith that we are saved. The key that opens that dark dungeon of sin, where we are bound, is faith in Jesus. That's it. So what's the problem? Why don't people just come on out? Well, Jesus helps us understand what what the problem is way back in chapter 3. And you can look there if you would like or just listen to these verses as I read them. But in chapter 3, Beginning in verse 19, this is, this is what Jesus says. He's, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God despite the light of the world coming into the world, shining into the darkness to liberate us from our sins, people still prefer the darkness. They love the darkness. Every time I read these verses, I think about my upbringing down in the South. South, I'm from South Carolina, if you didn't know. And down South, we, we have cockroaches. And I'm not talking cockroaches. I'm talking cockroaches. I mean, cockroaches that fly when you try to get them and get on you and all this kind of stuff. For for us at our home, (laughs) uh, pest control was not an option. I mean, if if we didn't do pest control, they're going to come inside and live with us. You know, we don't want that. And um, so we, we would, they stayed outside the house, thankfully. But on those hot summer nights when we would be out as a family, come, we would come back home and it'd be dark. And as, as, my, as my dad would turn into the driveway and, and the lights from the front of the car would just shine across the driveway, the driveway would just start moving. Now, that, that might be a little bit of an exaggeration. Okay? I mean, I was little. I mean, maybe, maybe I remember. But, but dozens of cockroaches would just... Head for the hills. Get out. There's light. Let's go to the darkness. The light has come into the world. And Jesus says people people just scatter. They run for the darkness. They can't handle the light. They don't want to be exposed. I mean, for one, you know, it can be extremely vulnerable to be exposed, can it? There, there are a lot of things that we've done that we're ashamed of, that we don't want anybody to know about. We, we don't want to come to the light. Coming to the light means we are surrendering to the light. We're, we're giving up our sinful ways, those ways that go against the Father. Or, or, or maybe we don't come to the light because, quite frankly, I love deciding for myself what's right and wrong. I love the darkness. So coming to the light is going to expose the depth of pride and dare I say even narcissism that exists in my own heart. I don't want that. Darkness is just too comfortable. It allows me to be who who I really am. We love it. Do you see the light of of his salvation. Jesus has come into the world as light 
so that whoever believes in Him may not remain in darkness. He wants to rescue you. He wants to give you a new life. He wants to set you on the path of light to bring you out of darkness, to give you a better life so that you can be a child of light. That's what He wants for you. Whoever believes in Him will not remain in darkness. He has overcome the darkness. Stronger than the darkness, new every morning, our sins are many. His mercy is more. We just sang it. And dear Christian, are, are, are there ways that you are covering up the light of salvation in your life? Maybe, maybe there's a little bit more tape around the Christmas lights. Perhaps going back to your sinful ways. You've allowed sin just to get a foothold in your life. Maybe, maybe you're not taking sin seriously enough. Keep walking in the light. He has overcome the darkness. Never lose sight of the light of salvation. Don't cover up the light of salvation. But while he holds out the light of salvation, we must realize that there's another aspect of that light, and it's the light of judgment. This is the third aspect, the light of judgment. Look with me again in verses 47 and 48. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me does not receive my word, uh, and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on that last day. It's very clear. Je Jesus didn't come to judge, but to save the world. And this is another reason to come to the light. He's not judging you. I mean, this image of a, of a capricious God that's sitting up there waiting for you to mess up so He can just send His lightning bolt of judgment down on you, it's just, it's just nowhere to be found. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's granted this, this time of repentance so that we may come to know Him. These are very comforting words, aren't they? I, I, I do not judge Him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. But, we can't just stop reading at verse 47, because there, there is a judgment to come. There's one to come in the future. For now, God is patient. For now, He gives time for repentance. For now, His mercy is, is abundant. He's ready to forgive, withholding His judgment. But there's coming a day where we will stand before His throne and we will be judged. The words that Jesus has spoken will be the judge on that last day. Listening to His words and then walking in disobedience is to reject Jesus. And in the final judgment, His word will stand as judge. And it's pretty simple. Did, did you obey or not? Now, in a strange way, this is kind of encouraging. We know. We know the standard by which we will be judged. He's not hiding anything. Jesus is not going to pull a fast one on us on that day. Say, oh yeah, by the way... You didn't read the back of the contract. You didn't read the fine print. There's a lot more here that you didn't do. No. He lays it out there. We know exactly what's going what's to happen. We don't need to be scared that there's something we didn't do, we didn't know about. You might be thinking at this point, well, yeah, okay, but you just said about the light of salvation that we're saved by faith. Now you're kind of giving this impression that we're saved by our works and our obedience. So which is it? And I would just say that this is not at all at odds with faith. Obedience flows from faith. It is the fruit of our faith in Jesus. The one who truly believes in Jesus will show her faith by walking in obedience. Lack of obedience reveals 
a lack of faith. And maybe you've seen this before. Maybe you know people who talk about how they grew up in the church and they, re- and they do believe in Jesus and, you know, yeah, I know something about Jesus, but man, when you look at their lives, it's like, wow, I don't, I don't see Jesus there. <laughs> I, I heard a devastating testimony one time. A young lady was, just, was sharing and saying that, you know, typical thing, she grew up in the church, um, knew all about Jesus, knew the Bible, and one day she got into a conversation with some of her friends. And she said, well, I'm a Christian. And her friends were like, what? Really? You're a Christian? She that really challenged her. <laughs> that really shook her up. It's almost like a, like a, a false belief, if you will. Just... Just kind of a, yeah, I believe, kind of like what James talks about, you know, that even the demons believe and tremble. But then he calls us to live out our faith. Faith without works is dead. Do you see the light of judgment? Do you understand the importance and the weight of coming to the light and giving your life to Jesus and walking in obedience to him? When we look to Jesus, we need to see the light of His divinity, the light of salvation, the light of His judgment, and finally, one last one, one last aspect, the light of His Word. The light of His Word. Now, the light of His Word could be included with the idea of judgment, obviously, because Jesus says, in the last day, it's my Word that's going to judge you. But I thought it would be good to kind of tease this out just just a little bit. Notice in verses 49 and 50, that Jesus grounds the word which He speaks in the authority of the Father. He speaks what the Father told Him to speak. And what He speaks is eternal life. Eternity is at stake. This goes far beyond just a a mere make my life better. Bless me, Jesus. Give me more money. Resolve the tensions in my family. Listen, Jesus will help us with those things, but there's more at stake than that. We're talking about eternity, eternal life. And the word that Jesus speaks gives us the grace, the mercy, the power to endure until that day. The words that he speaks gives us the patience that we need to persevere day in and day out. Do do you see the light of his word? The light of Christ shines brightly through his word. When, When we open the Bible, we see the glory of the light of his word. Jesus, the the, the king of the universe, the creator of all things, is speaking to us as we read his words. Dare I say that when we spend time in his word, it is a holy moment. Let's not sacrifice time in his word. It is a necessity for our spiritual growth, for our spiritual vitality. Don't don't play this down. Don't put that tape around this light. (laughs) Say, I don't really need it. Oh, it's so important. Come and feast on it. Come to His words, His commandments our eternal life. So these are the aspects of of the light. I think we see in this passage that the light of His divinity, the light of salvation, the light of His judgment, the light of His word. And we we need to see all of them. We we need to see all of the colors and all of the shimmering and all the, the, the different aspects to really understand and truly know 
who Jesus is. Covering up any one of them does us a great disservice. Do you see all these aspects? Do you see the light, the light, Jesus? And be it this time of year or any other time of year, don't get caught up into all the things that are around us and lose sight of the light. It's just not worth it. As the team comes up to close us in a song, I, I invite you just to reflect for a moment in your own, your own heart. What is there one of these lights, one of these aspects of the light that, you, that maybe you have been covering up a little bit? I, I know with me, personally, I just, and I, I told you last time I preached, and I'll say it again, but we're going through this whole process of selling our house in Italy, and, I, and boy, that, it, it, it's sometimes easy for me just to kind of cover up that divinity piece, right? That God's in control. He's got this. And I, and I want to just take control myself and make sure I have everything worked out. And I have to keep reminding myself. He's God, you're not. What might it be for you? What might it be for you? Let's bow our heads and... Jesus, we, we need you. We, we need you to shine brightly in our lives that we may behold you in all of your glory. That we might feel your presence each and every day. Life can be difficult at times and we need you. We need you to sustain us, to give us the mercy and the grace that we need. But even when those things are going good and there's lots of success around us we need to keep our our gaze upon you would you help us with that may this season lord that we're entering into as we remember the birth of your son may, may we not lose sight of the light may it blaze even brighter and more glorious than it ever has for us. In Jesus' name, amen.